بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. الحمد لله رب العالمين. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. الرحمن الرحيم. The beneficent, the merciful. مالك يوم الدين. Owner of the day of judgment. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. The alone we worship. The alone we ask for help. إهدنا الصراط المستقيم. Show us the straight path. صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. The path of those whom thou hast favored, not the path of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray. Again, all of us heard this uh, surah. It's the first surah of the Quran. If anyone opens the Quran, this is going to be the very first surah of the Quran. It's generally known to us by the name of Surah Fatiha. Now, there is a difference of opinion whether this surah was revealed in Mecca or whether this surah was revealed in Medina. Uh, Imam Qurtubi, in his Tafsir in volume 1 has recorded that people like Ibn Abbas, Qatada, Abu Aliya and others have stated that this uh, surah was revealed in Makkah. People like Abu Huraira, Mujahid, Atta bin Yasir have stated that this surah was revealed in Medina. There is also another view which says that this surah was revealed twice, once in Makkah and once in Medina. Imam Qurtubi in his tafsir mentions that the first view is correct that the surah was revealed in Makkah because Surah Fatiha was always part of the Salah and thus had to be revealed in Makkah. This is also the first surah in the Quran which was re revealed completely at one time and not in different stages. Now, as I stated, generally we know this surah by the name of Surah Fatiha. But this surah actually has many, many names. In Tafsir Tabari, volume 1, page 55, Imam Tabari has recorded a narration by Abu Huraira that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said that the Ummul Quran is the Ummul Quran. It is Fatiha Tul Kitab, it is Sabi Masani, it is the Glorious Quran. Darul uh, Durul Mansur, Volume 1, page 29, mentions that Imam Bukhari, Darmi, Abu Daud, Tirmidhi, etc., have all recorded from Abu Huraira that Prophet Muhammad wasallam said that this surah is Ummul Quran, Ummul Kitab, and Sabi Masani. Al Itkan reports as many as 25 names for this surah. These are actually, I'm going to go through some of the names, I'm going to mention some of the names. We're not going to go into the details of the names uh, because that would make it very, very uh, detailed. And uh, right now I just want to do this as short and in a, in a shortest possible time so that people don't get bored. This surah is called Al-Salat. It's called Surah Al-Hamd, which means the chapter of praise. Fatihatul Kitab. That means opening of the book, Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book, Ummul Quran, the mother of the Quran, as sabul Masani, the seven of repeated verses, Suratul Masani, the chapter of supplication, Fatihatul Quran, the introduction of the Quran, Suratul Sawal, the chapter of entreaty, Suratul Shukr, the chapter of gratitude, Wafia, that means complete. Kafia, 
that means sufficient, abundant, shafia, the curer. Okay. Umul Quran, the mother of the Quran. Uh, whoever asked that. Right. Believer asked that. Now we come to the status of the surah. Imam Tirmizi records from Abi bin Qab that the Prophet Muhammad said, Allah did not reveal a surah like Ummul Quran either in the Torah or in the Injil. This is the seven oft repeated verses. Another tradition states that there is not a surah like this even in the Quran. There is no surah that can be matched to Surah Fatiha. Surah Fatiha is also mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hijr that is chapter 15 verse 87 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, tells us we have given you the seven oft repeated verses and the glorious Quran in Durul Mansur volume 1 page 5 it is mentioned that the Mustadrak of Hakim reports that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Surah Fatiha the best of the Quran some ahadith also have it that the Surah Fatiha has the status of being two-third of the Quran. Furthermore, Abu Umama reports from the Holy Prophet wasallam that only four things were revealed from the treasures that lie beneath Allah's throne. These four things are Ummul Kitab, Ayat Al-Kursi, concluding verses of Surah Baqarah and Surah Qasr. In a tradition from Sayyidina Mujahid, it is said that one of the incidences when Iblis, that is Satan, he cried was when Surah Fatiha was revealed. Why would, why would Iblis cry at the revelation of Surah Fatiha? Because this is one of the most powerful prayers that has been handed down to the Muslims through Prophet Muhammad. And as we will go through the tafsir of the verses of this surah, uh, one will realize how powerful a surah it is. Imam Shafi in Ilam, Ibn Abi Sheba in Al Musnif, Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, and Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisai, Ibn Majah, and Bayhaki in their respective collections have reported from. Abada bin as samad that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever did not recite Fatihatul Kitab his salah is not perfect Imam Malik in his Muatta Sufyan bin Aina in his Tafsir Abu Ubeda in Fazail Ibn Abi Sheba and Ahmad in their Musnid Bukhari in his Juzul Quran Muslim in his Sahih Ibn Al-Anbari in his Mus Mus'haf Abu Dawood, Tirmizi, Nisai, Ibn Majah, Ibn Jarir, Ibn Hiban, Darkatni and Bayhaki in their respective Sunan have all reported from Abu Huraira that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said whoever prays the Salah and does not recite Ummul Quran then his Salah is incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. Tafsir Mazhari volume 1 page 30 reports a tra tradition from Abu Huraira where it is reported that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, Allah has said, the Salah, that is Surah Fatiha, is equally divided between me and my servant, and my servant will be given what he prays for. The Prophet continued, when the servant says Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, which means praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, Allah says, my servant has paid his homage to me. When he says Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, the most gracious, most merciful, Allah says, My servant has praised me. When the servant says Maliki Yomiddin, the master of the day of judgment, Allah says, My servant has proclaimed my greatness. When the servant says Iya kan abudu wa iya kan astain, you alone do we worship and to you alone do we pray for help. Allah says, this verse is common to me and my servant. He shall be given what he has prayed for. 
when the servant says ahdina sirat al mustaqim guide us to the straight path allah says all this is there for my servant he shall be given what he has praised, uh, prayed for imam darqatni has reported from abda that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ummul quran is a substitute for all the other ayahs but all the other ayahs are not a substitute for it this only shows the great status that has been given to this surah Maulana Maududi explains that Surah Al-Fatiha indirectly teaches that the best thing for a man is to pray for guidance to the straight path. To study the Quran when the mental attitude of a seeker of truth and to recognize the fact that the Lord of the universe is the source of all knowledge. He should therefore begin the study of the Quran with a prayer for guidance from the theme it becomes clear that the real relation between al-fatiha and the quran is not that of an introduction to a book but that of a prayer and its answer al-fatiha is the prayer from the servant and the quran is the answer from the master to his prayer the servant prays to allah to show him guidance and the master places the whole quran before him in answer to his prayer as if to say this is the guidance you begged from me benefits of this surah Durul Mansur volume 1 page 32 mentions that from Muawiyah bin Salim that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed a man who was suffering from a headache one of the Sahaba recited Ummul Quran into his ears and he was cured of the headache then the Prophet ﷺ said, This is Ummul Quran. It is a cure for all sickness. A tradition from Sayyidna Saib bin Yazid states that Saib said that the Holy Prophet ﷺ once recited Surah Al Fatiha and blew on him so that he may be saved from diseases. In Tahzeeb Tariq Damishq Al Kabir, Volume 6 page 292 it is recorded from Ibn Aus that the Prophet وسلم, said whoever of you goes to sleep should recite Ummul Quran and one more surah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then appoints on such a person an angel who stays with him when he wakes up from his sleep now we will go into the tafsir of the verses the first verse like we all heard is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim which means in the name of Allah the most gracious most merciful now, Maulana Daryabadi explains a more accurate although less elegant translation for Bismillah would be by the name of Allah which should be paraphrased as I seek the assistance of Allah as noted in Tafsir al-Qurtubi volume 1 page 219 Imam Qurtubi notes that this verse Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a gift given only to this Ummah and Prophet Solomon. So it was Prophet Solomon who received this gift first then it was not given to any of the Ummah of the messengers and then once again this gift was revealed unto the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Further Imam Qurtubi notes a tradition from Saad bin Abi Sakina who said I was told that Ali bin Abi Talib saw one person writing Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ali said write it beautifully because one person will receive forgiveness because he wrote Bismillah with beauty Another tradition records Saeed saying I received the news that one person saw Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim written on a piece of paper and he kissed it and touched it to his eyes because of this the person received forgiveness Imam Qurtubi in his Tafsir volume 1 page 221 explains brilliantly the relation between the number of the letters in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and the number of angels over hell he notes that <coughs> excuse me sorry for that he notes that Abdullah ibn Masood said whoever wants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would save him from the angels 
who take people to hell should always recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. For every letter of this, Allah subhanahu wa taala will create a barrier for every angel. Bismillah has 19 letters, which is the same as the number of angels over hell, as Allah subhanahu wa taala informs us in Surah Mudassar, chapter 74, verse 30. Over it are 19. Usman bin Affan asked the Prophet about the tafsir of Bismillah and the Prophet replied the Ba of the Bismillah refers to the special mercy, benevolence, divine favors and the beauty and grace found in that which he has created <coughs> sorry the scene refers to all which he has created meme refers to his kingdom and the nature the word Allah attests that there is no one worthy of worship besides him Rahman refers to him who is kind and is merciful towards everyone Rahim refers to a special mercy for the Mu'mineen. there is a similar explanation given by Kaab Ahbar as well Imam Qurtubi mentions another view as well uh, that each letter of Bismillah refers to one of the names or attributes of Allah example Ba refers to Basir, Seen, Samir, Meem, Malik, Alif, Allah, Lam, Latif, Ha, Hadi and so on so forth Tafsir Mazhari volume 1 page 21 notes a tradition by Abu Huraira that the Prophet said any great work done without beginning it with Bismillah is incomplete. Now many me many people might say that you know they started a huge project and it was completed and they were quite successful in it. But this saying of the Prophet does not mean that whatever you start without deciding would never finish. This saying talks about our spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say that we are beginning in the name of Allah, that we are seeking assistance from Allah, that shows how we acknowledge that we are the creation and are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and begin whatever we do by his name this also keeps it as a reminder to us that any success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else we cannot do anything on our own but whatever comes to us is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all praises belong to him in, in, taf in Tafheemul Quran volume 1 page 38 it is mentioned that Muslims are required to start everything with the name of Allah if this is done consciously and sincerely it will surely produce three good results first it will keep him away from evil because the very name of Allah will impel him to consider whether he is justified in associating his name with a wrong deed or an evil intention Secondly, the very mention of the name of Allah will create in him the right attitude of mind and direct him to the right direction. Thirdly, he will receive Allah's help and blessing and will be protected from the temptations of Satan. For Allah turns to a man when he turns to him. The following three verses that we have, I will go through the translation of those. Praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the world. Lord of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. These three verses mention some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses all these attributes and many more, all praise must be exclusively His. These praises include all praises offered in this world and in the hereafter, in the heavens and on the earth. Even the praises lauded to others will ultimately accrue to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He created them all and nurtured them. So even if anyone does not praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not in the least diminish His praiseworthiness. Nothing can man ever do to diminish it even by the size of an atom. Going to the second verse. Praise belongs to Allah the Lord of all the worlds Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alhamd according to Lane's Arabic English 
lexicon Hamd is not only praise as we normally explain it to be it also implies admiration and it implies the magnifying or honoring of the object thereof and lowliness humility and submissiveness in the person who offers it why do we praise something we only praise something when we are amazed by it and we know we could not have done the same similarly as the as the creation we know that we are nothing compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are in no position to do a minute fraction of the same which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do hence we show humility submissiveness and recognize that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves all praise and admiration we should also consider the significance of Al in Alhamd whenever Al comes before a noun or adjective in Arabic it intensifies the significance of that noun or ad adjective Al simply means the like when you say the God in the English language you are referring to the one supreme deity worthy of worship and when you say a God you are simply talking about any object of admiration or worship like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 45 verse 23 have you seen the one who has taken his nafs as his illa just like that in Arabic illa is any god you can worship your nafs as your illa but not Allah when you say Allah you are referring to the god similarly hamd can belong to anyone Rahman Rahim can be anyone too but when Al precedes them it intensifies their essence in so much that it means that you are referring to someone who is perfect in that like Ar Rahim the merciful would mean that the source of mercy and uh, the perfection of mercy belongs to the one and only being Allah hence when you say Alhamd then you are saying the praise the true and only praise and the highest form of appraisal belongs to Allah the Lord of the worlds an important point to be noted over here is that not only is praise for Allah but praise is only for Allah in these opening verses one cannot help but see the absolute monotheistic tone and theme present therein these verses show that it is God alone who is the recipient of all praise the praiseworthy the praised one none of his angels or prophets can be associated with him even by implication no man no so-called God no man God no star no idol none of his creation inherently possesses any good quality and those who have any it is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence praise worship devotion is only for Allah the creator of these qualities Imam Muslim recorded from Anas bin Malik that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said God is pleased with him who when eats praises Allah and when drinks praises Allah the next word in the same verse Rabb when uh, we see the same word Rabb used Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Rabb is used in this verse many have translated this word as Lord but this is a really poor translation for the Arabic word Rabb Rabb signifies not only the sovereign but also the sustainer the nourisher the regulator and the perfecter the relation in which Allah stands to all his creation is that of a righteous and compassionate ruler and surely not that of a mere father which our Christian brothers claim Alameen Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alameen Alam that is world is a collective noun and comprehends all the creatures of God this word is not generally used in its plural form however we see that in this verse Alameen denotes all kinds of genera and species as the world of men the world of animals the world of jinns the world of angels 
so on and so forth. This is why the plural form is used so that it can be clearly understood that each and every individual of the universe is the creature of God and of no one else and all are dependent on Him alone. Allah is not a tribal deity or the national God of any favored people or race. He is the universal patron, the all in all guardian of everything and everyone. He is not the God that can die or be killed by men, but is the ever living moral ruler of all there is in the heavens and on the earth. The Quran itself explains who Rabbul Alameen is. This is seen when Fir'aun asked, Wama Rabbul Alameen? That is, what is the Lord of the worlds? And Moses replied, Rabbus Samawati wal Ardi wama Bainahum. Which means, He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever there is between them. This is seen in chapter 26 of the Quran in verses 23 and 24. Coming to the third verse, Most Gracious, Most Merciful. Both the words Rahman and Rahim are derived from Rahmat, which signifies tenderness, requiring the exercise of beneficence, and thus comprising the idea of love and mercy. Both are intensive forms, the former denotes tenderness towards all his creatures in general, and the latter towards his worshippers in particular. The fourth verse, Master of the Day of Judgment. The position of these two verses is very interesting. Verse number 3 and verse number 4. Most gracious, most merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment. Right after it is mentioned that He is most gracious and most merciful, it is informed that He is the Master or Owner of the Day of Judgment. This serves dual purposes. One being that man is reminded of the day of judgment, that it is a reality and everyone has to face that day. Secondly, it also reminds us that it will be through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that <coughs> sorry. Secondly, we are reminded that it is going to be through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that anyone will be successful in the hereafter. It is, also, it is only through his excessively merciful nature that any person will enter paradise. Moreover, this verse also corrects the faulty doctrine taught by Christianity, where in the uh, Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 22, it is stated, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. The Quran corrects this doctrine and informs all mankind that it is only God who will judge on the day of judgment and no one else. Verse number 5 You alone do we worship and from you alone do we seek help. <coughs> I am really sorry about the coughs. I have a bad throat but anyways. Verse 5 In this verse the believer is making a statement of faith and once again we see the monotheistic theme all Muslims worship only one God and no one else. They seek help only from that same one God and no one else. The wording of the verse is also really important over here. Iya kana abudu is a pronoun which is placed before the verb for the sake of emphasis and a very strong one is intended by prefixing the pronoun with Iya. This emphasis is laid down because there is no place in Islam for any man, God, God the Son, God the Angel or God the Holy Spirit. In the Catholic Church we find that there are three forms of worship. These are known as Latria, that is the worship due to God, Hyperdulia, worship due to Mary, as the Catholic Encyclopedia informs us, as, and I am quoting it right now, as the Blessed Virgin has a separate and absolutely supereminent rank amongst the saints, the worship paid to her is called hyperdulia. Third form is dulia, 
which is worship due to saints and angels Islam recognizes no such distinctions and in it there is only one class of worship and that worship is due to God alone only one God hyperdulia uh, Asif is asking hyper what hyperdulia H Y P E R D U L I A Iya kana abudu Now let's analyze the word ibada over here We are made to pray Iya kana abudu This is a very purpose of our creation as Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 51 uh, verse 56 I have only created jinns and men that they may serve me what does ibadah mean what's ibadah ibadah is derived from the word abd which means slave bondsman servant what does an abd do he serves the master there are three ways due to which you can make someone your abd, your slave, your bondsman. By your good personality, by deceit, by force. By your goodness, if you have a good personality, people start admiring it. When they admire it, they start loving it. When they love it, then they love it with extreme love. They love it so much that they will do anything you will ask them to do. After that state, they might declare you divine as happened with two notable prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala namely Jesus Christ and Uzair may peace be on both of them by deceit some people get deceived by good looks and by way of speech of a particular person these days it is very common that people greatly admire actors because of their beauty and the characters they play they go to such extremes in admiration that they start worshipping them without even knowing it. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 204 There is the type of man whose speech about this world's life may dazzle thee and he calls Allah to witness about that which is in his heart yet is he the most contentious of enemies. An example of such a thing is where a person is worshipping someone else by deceit the comparison is a man who in winters wakes up at night performs ablution and then stands to pray and a man who wakes up at night to watch the interview of a particular celebrity on television a man who adores the personality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and desires to live his life accordingly and a man who adores a rock star puts posters of him on his wall and desires to become a rock star one day in these days the second form of people are in majority but they won't accept it even if, if you will tell them that they are worshipping that celebrity and not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you actually argue with them and prove to them they will turn away from you because of course truth is always better if a person cannot achieve anything in this world any material gains he falls into despair goes into depression oh I could not get this I'm going to go in a state of depression why because now we have if we have made ourselves love the world so much we have made ourselves love the material in this world so much that when we cannot get it when we cannot achieve it when we are pulled away from it we go into a state of depression we start moving away from the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what are we worshipping over here are we worshipping God or are we worshipping the world are we submitting to the laws of God or are we submitting to our desires this is what the state of the Ummah has come to today this is what the state is the third way by force you can make a free man your slave by force you can make him obey you do whatever you want by force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 41 verse 11 moreover he comprehended in his design the sky and it had been as smoke he said to it and to the earth come ye together willingly or unwillingly they said we do come together in willing obedience 
This verse shows that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have wanted, He would have made all of us believers by force. But it is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should be thankful to Him for this that He has given us the opportunity of choosing, of having the choice. And He has not forced us into submitting ourselves like like vegetables or robots now let's analyze what is to worship how do we worship someone can someone give me a time check how many how many minutes have I been going on for because I don't want to carry it along uh, carry it uh, too much please anyone give me the time check how do we worship someone worship or ibadah is excessive love of for someone Ibn Kathir gives the meaning of ibadah in his tafsir as linguistically ibadah means subdued for instance a road is described as muabada meaning paved in religious terminology ibadah implies to the utmost love and humility and fear one of its meanings is a feeling of profound love and admiration you worship someone when you know the qualities of that which is to be worshipped when you start giving extreme love to someone then you are always thinking about your beloved whenever you are doing something you are conscious about conscious about your beloved whether the beloved will like a certain act of yours or not if the act is abhorred by the beloved you refrain from it in fear of losing your beloved if the act is admired or recommended by the beloved you do it and you enjoy doing it that is the highest form of worship which should be given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone but some people they give it to others as well as Allah subhanahu wa as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 165 yet there are men who take for worship others besides Allah as equal they love them as they should love Allah but those of faith are overflowing in their love for Allah if only their unrighteous could see behold they would see the penalty that to Allah belongs all powers and Allah will strongly enforce the penalty so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us himself Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us himself in the Quran that true worship is to overflow in love for Allah those are true in faith the true worshippers the true abd on the other hand some people give this kind of love to others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as stated before hence they also commit a form of shirk we love you with such an extreme love that what whenever we do something we do it to please you when we eat we have an intention that by eating we will get energy to serve you better and we give thanks to you for giving us the food and we praise you for the delight the food gives to our senses when we wake up we think of you before going to sleep we remember you when we see the moon and the stars we praise you for we see your glory your mercy your power in your creation the sun and the moon are beautiful and they sing your praises and when we see them we proclaim glory be to Allah this is the attitude which a true believer should have in chapter 41 verse 37 among his signs are the night and the day and the sun and the moon adore not the sun and the moon but adore Allah who created them if it is him ye wish to serve in chapter 3 verse 191 men who celebrate the praises of Allah standing sitting and lying down on their sides and contemplate the wonders of creation in the heavens and the earth with the thought our Lord you have not created all this in vain glory to thee give us salvation from the penalty of the fire 
how can we increase our level of worship how can we increase our level of worship we admire or love someone only when we know how good someone is so to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should strive to know him better we can do that by contemplating on his creation in chapter 50 uh, verse 6 do not do they not look at the sky above them how we have made it and adorned it and there are no flaws in it chapter 15 verse 16 it is we who have set out the constellations in the heavens and made them fair seeming to all beholders he tells us about the stars the sun the moon he says there are signs in the alteration of the day and night there are signs in the creation of the heavens and the earth there are signs in your own selves there are signs in the rain there are signs in the cattle in the trees the different kinds of fruits colors variety of living things horse donkeys so many creation in many places in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them and then says in them there are signs for a people who understand in them there are signs for a people who use their intellect in them there are signs for a people who think and reflect what kind of signs the signs of his glory his greatness Imam Muslim mentions in his Sahih in book 2 hadith number 494 Ibn Abbas reported that he spent a night at the house of the Apostle of Allah may peace be on him the Apostle of Allah got up for prayer in the latter part of the night he went out looked towards the sky and then recited this verse which is from Surah Al Imran uh, verse number 190 verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of the night and the day there are signs for those who understand all the way up to the words save us from the torment of hell he then returned to his house used the tooth stick performed ablution then got up and offered the prayer he then lay down on the bed again and got up went out looked towards the sky and recited this verse again then returned used the tooth stick performed ablution and again offered prayer every form of knowledge helps us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better and increases our worship for him in chapter 6 verse 79 for me I have set my face firmly and truly towards him who has created the heavens and the earth and never shall I give partners to Allah when we will inshallah come to this uh, chapter and this particular verse we will expand on it more but right now we are not going to expand on this particular verse if someone could paste it on main as well so that others can have it uh, have a look at it as well chapter 6 verse 79 this is the attitude this is the faith system this is the belief system that the believer should have the latter part of the verse again carries the same monotheistic theme that is the latter part is from you alone do we seek help this is again very important and Muslims make a clear-cut statement when reciting it that they do not seek help from anything which is created but seek help from the one and only uncreated being that is God there are some people who seek help from a man God God the son the mother of God idols etc but Muslims seek help from the one and only creator they do not worship that which is created but he who is the creator verse 6 guide us to the straight path Sirat al Mustaqim. this is a very simple verse where the worshipper that is us are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sole being that we worship and seek help from to show us the right path and guide us while we are on that path the word mustaqim is derived from istakama which means to straighten up draw oneself up sit up to stand erect stand upright erect upright correct proper righteous it implies another deep meaning as well which is to remain firm or to stand firm without tilting take an example of a pendulum 
it keeps on oscillating left and right in that state it is not on sirat al mustaqim if you stop it and it remains like that then it is on sirat al mustaqim it goes into a state of istikama another example could be firmly grounded tree so that when a strong wind blows it does not affect it and it remains standing upright while the others are uprooted and destroyed and this is exactly how muslims should be we should be so strongly rooted into the fundamentals of islam in our relation with god that no form of temptation could ever ever take us to another path no form of temptation the the sirat path of al mustaqim is therefore a right path on which a person is firmly grounded it is just like as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran in chapter 41 verse 30 surely those who have declared our lord is allah then remain steadfast on them the angels will descend saying do not fear and do not grieve and be happy with the good news of the jannah that you have been promised only saying that our lord is allah and then remaining firmly grounded on this belief that is to become to go into a state of istiqama to stand firm straight means to live your whole life to please your lord who is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do whatever he commands if that happens then on such the angels descend whispering in their hearts fear not grieve not but receive glad tidings of the garden that which he have been promised the best example of a man who remained on sirat al mustaqim is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran ya seen wal quran al hakim inna kala min al mursalin ala sirat al mustaqim ya seen by the quran full of wisdom you o muhammad are indeed one of the messengers on a straight way sirat al mustaqim not only believing but acting on what you believe and then remaining firm on your on your acts like the five prime prayers the fasting etc that is sirat al mustaqim which we lack a lot today in ourselves and that is very in essential sirat al mustaqim for us to be on the right path first we say iya kana abdu wa iya kana astain then we say ihdina sirat al mustaqim it is only for allah to show us sirat al mustaqim so we are asking him please guide us to the right path ibadah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is should be the main purpose in our life is sirat al mustaqim isa said to his hawariyun in chapter 3 verse 51 it is allah who is my lord and your lord therefore worship him this is a way that is straight it means that if you spend your whole life devoted to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ibadah of him then you are on sirat al mustaqim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the quran in chapter 4 verse 175 Then those who believe in Allah and hold fast to him soon will he admit them to mercy and grace for him from himself and guide them to himself by a straight way Ibn Katsir mentions in his tafsir a hadith of the prophet reported by Ahmad uh, that An-Nawas bin Saman said that the prophet said Allah has set an example a sirat a straight path that is surrounded by two walls on both sides with several open doors within the walls covered with curtains there is a caller on the gate of the sirat who heralds o oh, people stay on the path and do not deviate from it <coughs> meanwhile a caller from above the path is also warning any person who wants to open any of these doors 
Woe unto you, do not open it, for if you open it, you will pass through. The straight path is Islam. The two walls are the limits set by Allah, while the doors resemble what Allah has prohibited. The collar on the gate of the Sirat is the book of Allah, while the collar above the Sirat is Allah's admonishment in the heart of every Muslim. Not of those who have incurred your wrath, nor of those who have gone astray. This verse concludes the prayer. The path which the worshipper prays to be guided to is the one where he will be bestowed with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The path which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed to the prophets may peace be upon them the righteous the martyrs the pious for us this path is the Quran which we are to adhere to this is the path as explained to us in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 69 all who obey Allah and the Apostle are in the company of, the, of those on whom is the grace of Allah namely of the prophets and the saints and the martyrs and the righteous as long as we obey Allah and His Messenger, we will be of those on whom Allah has bestowed His grace. However, it is sad, it is really sad, that today we Muslims adhere to the ways of the disbelievers. We wish to spend money on buying designer clothes, but do not bother to give any in charity. We wish to drink alcohol so that we do not become social outcasts. Today we are in a position where we are moving towards the ways of those who received the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every day we recite this surah praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the right path. We claim to seek the right path but unfortunately this prayer does not come from the bottom of our hearts anymore. We wish to spend hours learning to the most vulgar songs yet we do not bother to spend even 10 minutes reading the Quran. We say we believe in the day of judgment yet we do nothing to prepare for it. So today let us all take an oath and proclaim that we do not want to be led to a path due to which the previous people receive the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not wish to be led to a path of those who went astray, to be like those who are heedless and have no want for serious thinking or the want to be successful in this world and in the hereafter. We do not want to be on the path that would make us stand among the, amongst the losers in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lead us all to the straight path which would bring to us success in this life and in the hereafter. Amin Ya Rabbul Alameen. With this I conclude the tafsir of Surah Fatiha. Any mistakes were from me alone and any that was right and good was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Indeed all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا Okay, uh, firstly, it would never have been possible without all of you people. Uh, let's firstly thank Brother Cobra because it was his idea to start this thing. And uh, I think it was a great idea. Uh, what what I wanted to say was like, is does anyone have any questions regarding this? Does anyone want to take Maxwell's question? He's saying Icarus said people worship rock stars, but how does that really compare to worshiping God? Okay, as I was uh, saying, it it's more to the effect that people put the rock stars ahead of God. 
rather than you know um praying to God. That's what he was talking about more than um uh you know praying to God. They don't pray to the rock star in the sense that, you know, maybe like uh you know, oh rock star take me to heaven that right, someone asked Hey question. Maxwell, I think I know what you're asking. Um when when he says uh people worshiping people like rock stars or singers or actors, um that's when the person um uh you know clips newspaper articles about him dresses like him if he's a dancer or entertainer they they dr uh, they dance like him um uh, uh whatever the person wears the the fan I'll call him a fan cuz that's what he is yeah about ar-rahman and ar-rahim uh, I posted this earlier as well the root of the word Rahman and Rahim is re he mim Rahim. Uh, it means the womb, the receptacle of the young in the belly, and so on. And Rahma or Rahmat has the following meanings mercy, pity, compassion, and so forth. Now, Rahma is associated with Rahman, and it comprehends the entire universe without regard to our efforts, meaning that, you know, the Rahma is always there whether you are worshipping God or not, even the Kuffar, they, they are bestowed with certain things, even though they don't even ask for it, and some they don't even out him. It conveys the idea of constant repetition and continuous manifestation of reconstitutes the liberal reward to those who seek it, strive for it, and deserve it. It is the result of the action of the human beings. The attribute Rahim generally pertains to the life to come. Uh, the attribute Rahim is separable from the concept of Almighty and indicates an aspect of activity of God. Also, I would like to mention that on Kalamullah.com uh, I'll post the link here. There is actually a 28 disc set of uh, uh, the explanation of the Holy Quran. So if anyone is interested, they can go to kalamullah.com. Here's the link. It is by uh, Jamaluddin Zarabozo. And it is an excellent, excellent talk.